I think and I do believe that if we need in Europe people who make bridges, who bridge societies, cultures, sensibilities, sensitivities, political forms of sensitivity, uh, one of the most important bridges, at least as far as my experience is concerned, is Professor Bauman and his rich contribution to European intellectual life. Uh, I remember, and I will never forget, an episode from our friendship of which I am very, very proud and very happy, that once it was in Italy, it was in Turin, that uh, Professor Bauman, myself, and uh, some other friends, we were sitting, I remember, and I will never forget how some young people just started looking at Zygmunt Bauman. Finally, they approached him and they get a copy of his book and they asked a signature. And I thought to myself that no, if this happens not to a jazz or pop music star, but if this happens to an intellectual, to a writer, to an acclaimed academic, so this gives hope that not everything is lost in our life. So that's why I am very, very happy to be able to present uh, Professor Bauman. I don't think that we need any kind of excessive information. Everybody knows Professor Bauman's wonderful books. Uh, his books have been translated into Lithuanian, and I think we have to thank Ms. Gedra Kajalita, uh, head, the head of Apostrofa, an academic publisher and publishing company, which was ambitious and intelligent enough to start working with Professor Bauman's books some time ago, and that's how Professor Bauman's books, Globalization, Human Consequences, Liquid Love, came into existence in Lithuania. And now the new book is coming up, and the book which is titled Consuming Life, Vartoyamas Gigatmas in Lithuania. That's why, like in Shakespeare, Professor Bauman, enough of my words. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And let me just announce the title of the lecture, Selves as Objects of Consumption. Professor Zygmunt Bauman. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm afraid that uh, two great expectations were aroused by my uh, distinguished uh, uh, chairman and the director. Um, uh, so my only title to glory, uh, if there is any title to glory, is that I lived uh, unforgivably long, and uh, therefore I went through a uh, very variegated life experience, and uh, uh, I, in fact, uh, the one of the very few non-extinct yet dinosaurs of the old uh, times, uh, in this case, in, from the point of view, from the perspective of the topic of today's lecture, the old times means, uh, mean society of producers. Uh, because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going today to speak about consumption. Consumption is something very banal, very clear, something which we do every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And not just we, the human beings, but every uh, living organism has to consume. There is nothing new about it, and nothing particularly exciting. In order to uh, remain alive, we need to exchange matter uh, with nature, with the environment. I doubt whether in everyone's body here there are very mol many molecules where they say 40, 50 years ago, or in moment of birth, it's all has been exchanged. It is, as I said, nothing particularly exciting. Uh, well, obviously, if I had uh, skills, uh, education of uh, 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 biologists or physiologists, I would uh, be able to show you quite an interesting picture of what is happening with things which we consume. But I. I don't have the skills, and uh, I will limit myself to the phenomenon uh, of uh, what I call not consumption, but consumerism. Consumerism is a form of life of society of consumers, which we are now. Whereas of the nations, the conditions of human happiness were measured by the number of uh, industrial workers, which country could have, and number 
of potential soldiers which would defend the country if, uh, in case of necessity. And I think the form of life of uh, society of producers was subjected to this particular double purpose of uh, 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 human community. After 11 uh, September, if you remember, the uh, uh, George W. Bush, the president of the United States of America, appealed to Americans uh, to return after this awful shock to normal life, to ignore it, to uh, express their enhanced patriotism. And I'm not sure whether by slip of tongue or because of his deep convictions, he formulated his call in the following way, go back shopping, America. <laughs> Sign of patriotism, uh, well, it proof actually of patriotism, and uh, the meaning of normality, normal life, means a uh, life of shock. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you probably remember very well what you have been uh, told many times about, about the vision of the world which accompanied the beginning of this great leap towards orderly society, big factory and a big uh, conscript army which modernity wanted to create. Um, Hobbes was the author of the uh, uh, famous uh, statement that without society, the human life will be uh, nasty, brutish, and short. We are, by inclination, by birth, rather aggressive people, and rather egoistic people, and in order to keep us under control, we need society with its coercive power, uh, which will prevent us from jumping to each other's throats and cutting each other's throats. There is uh, a, an alternative to Hobbesian vision of the world, uh, the very opposite of it, as a matter of fact, which comes from uh, the uh, I think uh, greatest ethical philosopher of the 20th century, Emmanuel Levinas. Okay. Emmanuel Levinas uh, starts from uh, the other, other, other end of uh, human existence, of human position in the world. He says that we are all born with some sort of a moral impulse. Uh, the sight of the other person awakes uh, the uh, uh, feeling of responsibility for the other human existence, for the other human well-being. It comes to us somehow subconsciously, somehow subconsciously, uh, without any coercion. The other, other human being whom we meet does not demand Anything. I'm not speaking about beggars are acting for charity. Uh, it, it, it doesn't put us uh, in front of, uh, of any kind of obligation. And uh, he is not a powerful person who is able to coerce us into the service. On the contrary, what uh, Emmanuel Levinas says is that he calls us, calls us and commands us by his weakness and his silence, or her weakness and her silence. And that is a pre-social human condition, according to Emmanuel Levinas. The feeling, the impulse, the intuition of responsibility for another human being. But this feeling, being intuitive feeling, not codified, not codified, not written down in the form of law or any sort like that, uh, is underdefined. We don't know what does it mean to be responsible for another human being. 
It is an unconditional responsibility, which in principle would require sacrifice of everything personal for the sake of the other, but uh, if that responsibility was taken in such absolutistic form, then I would suggest uh, Levinas would become impossible. You can't build society on this moral demand of absolute responsibility and conditional responsibility for the other. He says quite frankly, look, uh, this uh, responsibility, if God created humanity and the universe, uh, he created it uh, for the saints, for the saints. We ordinary people are not saints. We are not able to sacrifice everything for the other. And therefore, to reduce this absolute responsibility to human ability, to the level of human ability, your my ability, society is necessary. Not to suppress our aggressiveness, but to make a coexistence of moral people conceivable. Otherwise, it will be impossible. How does society do that? Well, it supplies this underdefined, very generalistic, very fluid, very misty demand of exercising responsibility for other being uh, welfare. Uh, it uh, supplies that with a list of exact, specified, spelled out duties, obligations. Here is your universe of moral obligations, and here it ends. That is what you need to do, and that is what you can excuse yourself from doing. Well, it's opening of a, of a box of worms, of course, because from this point starts endless and insoluble discussion how you can, whether this particular spelling, whether this particular codification of moral duties is proper or not. Uh, there is a beautiful uh, English saying that guilty conscience does not need accuser. Uh, in order to feel guilty, we don't need somebody coming and telling us. We always feel that we have, we didn't do enough. That was not, we could do more, we could do more. Whatever we do, there is always this bitter sediment, you know, this memory of uh, some neglect, uh, not necessary neglect. On the other hand, we seek desperately excuses, apologies. We very seldom say, I didn't do it because I didn't want. We much prefer saying, I didn't do it because I couldn't. That leaves uh, conscience a little bit more quiet, not completely, not entirely, mind you, but a little bit more quiet than otherwise it would be. And here, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest to you, in this field, we can place consumers. Because consumerism is a contraption uh, which, in a sense, in a very perverse sense, to be sure, and not in the sense which Levinas himself expected, but it follows this intuition of Levinas. It makes living together livable when the challenges are simply challenges which really would require our considered reaction are too high, too uh, powerful, uh, to be easily resolved with uh, means at our disposal. 